Hello, and thank you for joining us for our tutorial on Olson's Concrete Thickness Gauge. Today I'm going to be covering a little bit of background on the Concrete Thickness Gauge itself, how the system is delivered, and what components it has. Now, the Concrete Thickness Gauge uses the Impact Echo technique for the test, so I'll be covering some theory on Impact Echo testing, and how to con correctly carry out this test, some of the nuances behind it and some of the limitations and ways it can be used. I'll then go through Olson's WinCTG software in detail, covering all of the parameters, all the ways files can be saved, and what um, we can do with the data from that. And I'll also cover the correct way to conduct a normal test and to conduct a more difficult test for thicker sections or where you have a more confused geometry than just a flat play. This will become clear when I go through the theory of impact echo. So I'll begin with a quick presentation on the CTG as delivered. So this is the packing case for the concrete thickness gauge. Inside we first see manuals and certificates, and then the concrete thickness gauge itself. The key components of the concrete thickness gauge are the sensor, which is the white button, and the impactor, which is the left solenoid. There is a small light on top, on the top left now, and if we click the power on with the switch on the bottom right, it will go green if there's sufficient battery, and this is the switch for firing the impactor, as you can see here. The unit supplied with two sets of batteries. This USB key contains the um, software and a digital copy of the manuals. And this is a standard audio cable used with the CTG. It's a tip ring sleeve cable. I'll explain a little more about that in a second. This is a audio adapter, which makes it very easy to use with the computer. This one is USB and has a microphone and headset input we'll be using the microphone input. Again, I'll explain that in a second when I cover connecting the system to the, your PC. But if we hook it like this, and then into the connector on the CTG, this is the standard wiring setup to use the CTG. Now, if you have a small Windows tablet, it may not have a full-size USB port. So this is a converter from USB to micro USB. Now, I'll go back and take you through a little bit of the theory behind Impact Echo. And always remember to turn off the unit before putting it back in its case, or the batteries will run down. Thank you. So, having gone through the hardware of the concrete thickness gauge, let's talk a bit about the theory of how it works. The concrete thickness gauge is an Impact Echo test system, so let's look at what happens when we strike a piece of concrete. We produce a number of different seismic energy waves. The compression wave is the fastest um, and is a um, direct compression and expansion in line with the strike. The shear wave is a side-to-side -side motion and is slightly slower. And the R wave or Rayleigh waves are a surface measurement. Impact echo is a uh, compression wave test, which is also, um, also known as P waves, and in particular, it's a resonant test of that. So, um, the advantages of compression waves is they're the first to send and first to receive um, because of their speed, um, but in this case, their relationship to sound is what we're taking advantage of. So, when we strike, we get an omnidirectional energy source and we will get echoes from anything that this wavefront strikes. Now an impact echo test under ideal circumstances is just done on a flat plate, so the only source of echoes is going to be the bottom of the slab. And this is what we take it, uh, and this is how you take benefits when we're doing impact echo. So with impact echo, we take the arriving sound waves and from those, we produce a spectrum graph. So 
It's a little bit small, but if you have a look in here, this is the arriving sound wave um, to the white sensor of the concrete thickness gauge. And this is the converted frequency spectrum with a dominant outcome and a thickness measurement. You can see this frequency spectrum graph um, in a bit more detail up here. And in this case, the test was a test of a 250 millimeter thick section. And we can see that we've got a frequency and a thickness. The frequency is the raw data. The thickness is resolved by estimating or measuring the velocity of compression waves in that structure. Now, one of the big advantages of Impact Echo is it's quick, it's simple, and it's very sensitive to things that change the geometry of that slab. So if you have small amounts of voiding inside a flat plate, it will, be, it will detect them. And this is what we take advantage of when uh, we use floor detection. So at its most basic measurement, it's a thickness test. We only need one side to access the slab. And we can take a point measurement um, and build up a diagram of the thicknesses. So the chart on the top right was created using output from WinCTG software on a ramp slab. So the, ramp, so the slab is thicker on the right-hand side, getting going from around 500 millimeters to 650 millimeters over the length of the structure. Um, and each of these colored squares is representing a single impact echo test. That's a frequency spectrum graph where the dominant frequency, which is the frequency of the most energy has been picked, and it's been converted to a thickness or a depth using a velocity. So where we have small voiding issues like poor consolidation or honeycomb concrete, we get a characteristic change in those frequency measurements. So the raw, again, the raw data from impact echo is frequency. And if it's a single flat plate of concrete, the only thing that controls that frequency is thickness. So we get a direct thickness measurement when we convert with velocity. If we take the same geometry and we apply small amounts of voiding within that, then we change our frequency. We cause what's called a redshift, which is a lower frequency result. And this lower frequency result is indicative of minor voiding. It's essentially as if we made it more hollow, so the sound waves become deeper, lower in frequency. Now, once we get to larger voids, it changes a bit because those vo that voiding is sufficient to, rather than alter a standard test, it changes the geometry of the test, and we're now just testing the thin section above the void. So that's where we get a shift of to a higher frequency. A higher frequency corresponds to a thinner section. Now, there's a couple of limits about where you can do the test, particularly for thickness. So the first thing is, when we take any impact echo test, it's only measuring information on the internal concrete. It doesn't pick up anything about the support conditions beneath the slab, or if there's air or soil under there. It doesn't pick up anything about the way the slab's supported. It's only telling us what's happening inside the concrete. There's a limit on how thin a section can be, so I'll talk a bit about a bit more in a section, but essentially there's going to be areas that are too thin to be tested, and there's also going to be a, a threshold where maybe the concrete thickness gauge isn't the right system. Um, once you're above about 100 mils, then you're good out to the maximum range of the impact echo test. Now, if you have a surface coating, it does depend on what type of surface coating. If it's relatively thin and very well bonded, like maybe a painted surface, it shouldn't affect the test at all. It just essentially um, acts as part of the whole thing, and it's so thin it has no effect on the measurement. But if that surface coating was to debond or separate from the surface, you wouldn't be able to test through it. The sound wave simply wouldn't travel through that debonded coating. Um, it's also, if you have thicker coatings or rubbery coatings, they may also prevent correct testing with impact echo. Now, this test is so sensitive to the presence of 
air voiding separation within a concrete structure that if you have something like a open crack or crack uh, um, in the line of the test that crack is going to affect the test so much you could no longer use it as a thickness measurement so in the example up here we have a properly bonded section here which should measure the thickness correctly but where there is a open crack um, or a pore join between the top pore and the bottom pore, that is going to be much more controlling of the test. So if you're looking to ascertain defects like that, it's the perfect choice. But if bonding is perhaps not so important, it's going to prevent testing. Something like if you're grouting beneath concrete and it's not so important that you have a perfect bond but you do have proper support, the test would no longer be suitable. Um, and finally, the geometry is very important to the test. If you are too close to the edges, your resonance is changed by reflections from the edge. And it also, if you have no flat surface, like in a circular column, the test is very complex to work with. It's not impossible, but it more, becomes more about characterizing what a good result is, because it should be consistent for everything of that circular section, and then comparing it to other unknown areas, but it's no longer a basic thickness measurement. Similarly, where you have internal details, they'll have the same effect, um, and the test is no longer a r interpretable as thickness, but the frequency spectrum still has quite a bit of meaning. So going beyond it, let's talk a little bit about the limitations of the concrete thickness gauge hardware. A concrete thickness gauge is the simplest option from Olsen for impact echo testing. And it comes with a few limitations. The main one is its minimum thickness. So you can't go beneath around 100 millimeters. That's not absolute, but it's a very good guideline. Now, the maximum for all impact echo tests using the, um, uh, the point sensors is around 1 to 1.8 meters, depending upon um, the section of the concrete. So it's quite a good shallow foundation test, but it's not suitable for things like pile foundations or anything uh, deep and columnar. Um, the other thing is, for everything except the scanning systems, impact echo is a point measurement, so if you want to measure an entire slab, you'd work over a grid reference. Um, and there is features in the software to make it easy to collect that grid and to output it for future charting. Now, if you do have requirements that go beyond what the concrete thickness gauge can do, Olsen Instruments ND360 or Freedom Data PC systems have an expanded impact echo capacity there's a slightly faster uh, digital analog converter in these systems, which means they can go a lot thinner than the concrete thickness gauge can. With the standard impact echo head, i.e. one by the nomenclature, that is now maybe 80 millimeters minimum thickness, uh, which is the minimum you can do with the standard impactor. There's also a specialized super thin impactor, which changes the frequency of the strike, and that reduces your minimum to maybe 40 to 50 mils. And that's the absolute um, thinnest the test can go to. It, it beyond that, the, it becomes nearly impossible to send in a high enough frequency measurement. Now, there's also a scanning system, the Impact Echo Scanner, which allows, rather than point measurements, a line of measurement to be taken. So if you need very fast productivity, you need to cover um, entire floor sections or entire wall sections very quickly, 100% scanning, then the Impact Echo Scanner would be a useful improvement. So to use the concrete thickness gauge, it needs to be connected to the PC. And this is done through the sound system of that PC. So the first thing is to know what's the correct port to plug that into and what the right cable is. There's two kinds of common ports which you can plug a microphone into and it'll depend which one your PC has. Some PCs separate the microphone from the headphone output. Um, these are illustrated as on the left. The color coding is pink if color coded, and it shows a single microphone and a separate headphone. When this is the case, you just need to use the standard included um, tip ring sleeve cable, which appears like the one on the left with two insulating bands. Alternatively, and this is quite common with uh, smaller laptops, there may be a confined headphone, headset socket which has the headphone and microphone 
on one cable, in which case you'll need to use a tip ring ring sleeve adapter that runs the three band input plug and separates the microphone and headphone inputs. Now, the older generation of concrete thickness gauges would include a tip ring ring sleeve adapter, um, but the newer CTG and any you purchase today are going to come with a USB adapter which has the microphone and headsets separately. Um, so if you do have that USB adapter, I recommend using that. It's going to be a little bit more straightforward. Once you've connected the concrete thickness gauge to your computer, you need to make sure it's the default recording device. Now, the instructions I'm giving here is for Windows 10, but it's a very similar process in Windows 7 or an earlier version of Windows. So everything's plugged in, and you then need to access the sound menus in the computer. The simplest way to do that is on the bottom right hand corner you have the quick access icons and you're looking for the one that represents a speaker like this. So Now if you can't see this quick access icon it may be hidden under the small arrow which opens up a larger selection. So once you right click this is displayed and on Windows 10 you'll select sounds. There'll be a similar option on an earlier version of Windows. And within sounds, you need to go to the recording device tab where you'll see all of the different microphones connected to your computer. Um, this example is using the included USB adapter with the CTG and you can see it as a USB audio device and this green uh, tick indicates that it's the default device. It's also written in text next to that. So if this is what you see, you're all good to go. Um, and if you want to double check, you can just gently tap the white sensor on your desk or the ground, and you should see a little bit of sound coming in on this levels chart here. If you're not the default device, you can right click on the microphone and select set as default device. So to summarize, you connect the CTG to your computer with a TRS cable if it's the USB adapter, um, or you would use a tip ring ring sleeve adapter if it's going into a headset port. You then open your sounds menu and you confirm the CTG is your default device. And if not, you can right click on it and set it as default device. And finally, it may be that when you go to use the software, it may be a little bit quiet. Um, I'll talk about this more when we open the software, but I'll just show you where the setting is. So if we've right-clicked on the microphone and we bring up the set, we can use properties to access the microphone properties. And then if we go to the levels tab, we have the ability to increase the volume of the microphone and to control a microphone boost function for some versions. So this is a valuable tool if you're having trouble getting enough signal into the computer. So I'm going to open up a copy of the WinCTG software now, and I'm going to go through using it to set up and collect data, and I'm also going to cover the different data analysis features. So with WinCTG, you can just take a unsaved test to quickly take a measurement or just look at what input you're getting to the machine. You can set up and save individual files or a group of files with the same file name and an incrementing number. And you can also put some metadata information, so the position on the grid, the name of the project, and where that test was taken. Now, for data analysis, you'll be able to filter your incoming sound waves which affects what's shown on the spectrum graph. You'll be able to select the velocity for the frequency to thickness conversion, and you can also do a depth calibration where you have a known depth to set this velocity based upon the depth that you've measured. I'll cover all this in a second as I take a conventional and a more complex test. Thank you. To conduct a measurement with the CTG, we connect the cable as previously shown, turn the unit on, ensuring there's a clear green light in the on panel, 
we place the back feet that's the furthest from the cable on the ground, roll it forward and press with a mid strength on the surface and pull the trigger, firing the impactor to take the test. We're now looking at the screen of the WinCTG software. And I'm just going to start by taking you through what each of the options does. So open allows us to uh, bring up a previously collected file, save, um, finalizes a saved file, or saves a file after you've changed a parameter. Setup file name is used to prepare the name that you will use for a string of tests, each of which will be saved with an increasing number. Save parameters and reset parameters allow you to save your favorite uh, interpretation settings, so things like your velocity, expected concrete thicknesses, and filter settings. Reset parameter restores the ones that you've saved. Export allows you to export a frequency value and a converted thickness along with the geometric position from a linked string of tests. I'll take you through that in detail too. Um, metric can be used to toggle between English and metric units. I'll leave that set to metric. And status just reports what status we're in. You can see the current version of the software in the top right hand corner. The second bar of information is used to set up your machine or to complete a test. Calibration is specifically a depth calibration. You give the machine a known value of thickness. So in this case, I could give it 250 millimeters thickness. And when I press OK, I can um, use this to correctly adjust my calibration. So in this case, I won't. So I also have start, which takes a saved test. So if I press start, the machine is going to um, wait for input. And then I'll be able to accept or reject that input and then save the file. View instead is used to take a measurement without saving. So if I just want to take a single impact and see the thickness, I'd use view. Velocity is specifically the conversion for depth. So if my thicknesses um, are coming in wrong and I know it, I can adjust my velocity. Or if I've used ultrasonic pulse velocity, I could enter the velocity here to bring my measurements into check. Accept and reject are used during testing to confirm that I've taken a sufficiently good test. And X and Y are the actual position that the, that the test is currently in. Um, if this is separate to my geometry, which is the grid I'm going to be working to. So X and Y is the position of the current test. And length X, length Y, start X, start Y define the test area. Now, volume is very important. This is analogous to gain in other tests, and I adjust this to make sure that I don't have too much signal on the time domain signal or too little. I'll show you that in a second. This funnel is another very important option because I use this funnel to control my filter settings, and it's currently set to a little below 4,000, which is a general testing setup. Um, Filtering is a complex topic, but for concrete thickness measurements with Impact Echo, we're always using a high-pass filter with a frequency usually no higher than 4,000 hertz, and we may reduce that frequency, perhaps as low as 500 hertz, when we want to test a thick section. What a filter does is it directly attenuates, which is reduces the signal for a high-pass filter below the chosen frequency, and that's F1. F2 is not used for a high-pass filter. So if we compare this to our spectrum graph on the bottom here, we can see that the dominant frequency of this test was a 7,580, well above the filtering. But my filter here is set to 3657, which is around about here. And we can see it's, all, it's beginning to further reduce the signal below that point. So this is what we use a high-pass, essentially to isolate the regions of the spectrum graph that we care about. I'll turn it off quickly 
and you see that we have this extremely large energy spike at a frequency of just above 100 hertz. This is pretty common for impact echo sensors because the motion of the hand, the motion of the structure, is actually picked up as low frequency noise. So the filter cuts the noise for us and lets us do the test correctly. So I'll begin by showing you how to complete a single non-saved measurement. So we press view and then we trigger a test and in this case the machines come up with recommend data be rejected and the reason for that is that we have a very low amount of signal. The test itself is still very likely a successful test but there's so little signal the noise on the electrical line of the circuit is too much so I'm going to go ahead and reject that and I'm going to use my volume which as I said is analogous to gain to increase the signal coming into the machine so I've put my volume to 50 now and I'll trigger a test still not enough so I'll keep going um, I may also want to press a little bit more firmly with the sensor which does increase the energy too so I'll trigger another test and there we have it see we've now got more signal um, we're above 0.2 and minus 2 amplitudes and we can see we've got almost exactly the same graph as before but our signal to noise content on that signal is appropriate so we can accept that and in this case we've come back to our calibration and it's adjusted the velocity so this, this now exactly represents a 250 millimeter thickness slab which is what I'm testing on so I'll show you that calibration procedure again we press calibrate we enter the thickness we save it and now we will trigger a test we get a dominant frequency of 7368 and when we accept it the velocity is reset based upon that so now that I've set my velocity I can press view to do a thickness measurement so now when I trigger my test I don't have anything except the display of frequency. Now let's talk about setting up to save a measurement. I can begin by naming a project and giving it some rough position. So if we're going to work over a one meter grid. We can set it up. We can tell it where we're going to begin to and how much we're going to move. So if I want to measure every 10 centimeters, I would do it like this. So my position is either going to be, so we can start at the origin, and that's the bottom left of the chart, and then we can move it um, 0 0.1 mil each time, and we use the moving x and moving y to define how it moves. So let's start a test this time, and it's going to ask me to save a file. and now it's going to wait. So I'll trigger a test and similar to when we were calibrating we have an accept and reject option and we can review our waveform. Now I can tell this is a good waveform because it has a characteristic funnel shape which is the signal arrives at its strongest point on the left hand side and then slopes away to nothing. So I'm happy with this. The thickness graph has a dominant frequency so this is a reasonable test so I can choose to accept it and it saves that file as CTG tutorial dash single like I selected. Um, I can also look at my now if I was to start a second test um, it's not going to move the X in my position because in order to do that I need to choose the, the setup file name option. But until I complete this test, I'll trigger a measurement. And again, I've got the accept or reject. I'll show you what happens if I press reject. It expects me to do another measurement, so I trigger another until my waveform looks appropriate. I accept it and save it. So let's set up a file name now, which is how I would create a log. So all of our details visible, setup file name, 
So we can call, we can we have a directory, in this case CTG data, we have a file name prefix, and we have a starting number. Now this number is just a file name number, it has no information about the position. We're going to keep our information in the geometry section. So now when I hit start, whenever I use the start button now, it's going to add to my new file name. So I'll press start now. Again, we're waiting. And we've uh, done triggered a test. Um, we can see that it's already incremented us by point, by point 0.1. In this case, I want to stay at zero because this is my origin test. So I'll adjust x and y position to zero, zero. I'll review my chart, make sure my measurement is correct, and I'll press accept, saving that file. I didn't have to enter a file name this time. Now, I'd move my sensor 10 centimeters to along to the next position on my chart, and now I'll press start. And I'll trigger a test. My x position is correct now, point 0.1. Accept, and I'm going to keep working. So start, check it's point 0.2, trigger test, accept, and I'll keep working, triggering tests, and another, I'm just, and I'm just going to work across to another, uh, until I've got, I'm going to go to point 0.5 in this case, just to represent where I am, and in this case, I can just bring it straight back to zero, move it up to point 0.1, and we're going to do another test. So start. Again, checking X and Y. It's, and it's moved up a little, so we'll bring it back to zero. 0 0.1. So now we're back to the origin on the left, but we're going up one line. And I can trigger the test. And begin the new one. So I'll do a few more here. Another. Okay, so that's given me a second line of results. And what I've done now is I've up to, I'm up to file name tutorial 12. So I've taken 12 measurements um, with a X position between 0 and 0 0.5, so 0 to 500 mils. And I've done two, two rows, so one at Y0 and one at Y0.1. So now if I go to my export function, I tell it how many files, the start number and the file name, so tutorial started at 1, gone up to 12, and they have an output file name as well. And we tell it to output. And it's going to review all those results, take the frequencies, thicknesses, and positions, and I'll just open that file up to show you. And we can see here, it's a comma-separated file with each file name, its position in X and Y in meters recorded, along with a frequency and a thickness. This is a really easy format to import into Excel or to other graphing software. So this is how you use the CTG to do a grid measurement. And the, the only thing, and the, this is why I was working pretty carefully, was I was double checking my X and Y position as I worked, just to make sure that all came in where I expected. If it, it just makes everything a little smoother to double check as you work. Um, this is obviously a lot quicker than noting things down on a notepad. So, one more example I want to give now is how to do a test without using the built-in impactor. So as you saw when I was triggering a test, I would pull the trigger. But we also have an option to do a manual impact, and this is really important if we're trying to measure something thicker. So let me show you how I'd set up to do a thick measurement. It'll still be on the same sample area, so it's not perfect, but the settings will be correct. So, the ways I can do this, I can either use the expected concrete thickness option, so if I set this to say 1000 millimeters and press tab to go out of it, what's changed? My filter has gone from its 3600 setting to 2000, which of course means the other thing I could do is I could adjust my filter manually and tab out. Either one is appropriate, because what we do when we reduce the F1 hertz value for the filter is we allow for a deeper test. So expected concrete thickness or this is appropriate. Now 
because I'm going to be doing a different kind of test, I'd want to set up my file name again. And I'd be good to go. Um, I could also adjust my geometry at this point if I chose to. Though I'm not really going to be concerning myself with geometry, so maybe I'll just leave it at 0 and 0. Just to show that I'm just doing a single line of measurements if I want to go in a string. Now, the other thing I do differently is I start my test as normal, and instead of using the trigger button, I will tap the surface. And the size of the impactor is going to depend upon what I'm doing. If it's maybe 500 thick, I might just use uh, something round and small like I'm using here. If it was quite deep, maybe a meter, I might use a very small ball peen hammer. So I'll tap the surface. We have the same measurement, but our data looks a little bit different. This is because of the different frequencies that come from a manual strike versus the impactor. We've got more low frequency energy content, which lets, th lets us test deeper. So I just accept, accept that as normal, and my test was successful. So I could move to the next spot, start the test, strike the surface again. And in this case, I didn't hit it hard enough. There wasn't enough signal, just like with the trigger. Now, I'm not going to bother changing my volume or pressing further. I'm just going to reject it and hit again a little bit harder. And we get more signal. We can see it's quite a bit louder. But in this case, we've got all of this noise on the right-hand side here, and it's picked the wrong thickness. I'm not expecting a shallow test, so I'm going to reject this one based upon the fact that the dominant peak selected is probably due to noise. So I'm going to be a little bit more careful to review my outcomes here. So I'll reject, and I'll strike again. No, I may be a little bit weaker. And now, the we're finding again that thickness. And you see, it's not doing a very good job of a 250 mil thickness measurement. The built-in impact is better for that relatively high 7,000 hertz frequency. But if I was working over a deeper material, I'd be... I'd be actually getting a better outcome. And again, when you go to very deep sections, the ball peen hammer can be excellent. So that's how you do a manual test. And whenever you're having difficulties with, say, a rough surface finish, or when you think the thickness is getting beyond what the automatic impact it can do, it's good to reach for the little hammer or the something round-ended just to start tapping the surface rather than using the built-in impactor. Now, that's the basics of the software. If there's any questions or there's any other support that we can offer as PCTE, please do reach out to us. Um, any of our staff are always happy to talk through the operation of the system, but that should give you an overview of what all the settings do, where the critical uh, areas are. There's a little bit more detail in the manual as well, and thank you very much for watching.